Welcome to Christian Virtual Fellowship, a production of Allegiance to the King. You can find us on Facebook and also at allegiancetothekingorg My name is Raymond Scott. My offering today is about the book of Job. In this video, let's read the first two chapters of the book of Job and then talk about what God reveals to us in them. The book of Job has 42 chapters, and I'm not going to try to summarize it all at this time, but let's take a close look at the first two chapters. Job is betrayed, portrayed as a certain type of Christ, just as our Lord Jesus was tried, suffered and died without cause, and was faithful to the creator to the end. Job is called upon to be faithful to our God when stripped of wealth and health. The book of Job is mainly written in the form of poetry. Only the first two chapters and two thirds of the last chapter are prose. We don't know the author's name other than it was God inspired. The structure of the book of Job. Chapters one and two are an introduction to Job. We will cover these two chapters today. And then there's in chapter three, Job's complaint. And then in chapters four to 27, there are the three miserable comforters, friends of Job that come to comfort him and Job's responses to them. And chapter 28 contains a poem about wisdom. The entire book is categorized as one of wisdom. Chapters 29 to 31, has God restate his claim to God? Chapters 32 to 37 has a fifth character showing up and he rebukes Job. And then finally in chapters 38 through 41, God replies to Job. And then in chapter 42, Job replies to God and God restores him. I hope to show you that the book of Job reveals that God's wisdom in promising humanity exaltation, that is the kingdom of God, was demonstrated to the population of heaven through the trial Job endured. Our God is awesome. And while deeply concerned about humanity, he loves and is concerned about the rest of his creation as well. Our relationship with God can be based on hope, as well as awe, reverence, loyal love, and gratitude. Our relationship is a two-way one, and we should expect God to respond to us. So now let's read the first two chapters of Job and talk about them. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send word and invite their sisters, their three sisters to eat and drink with them. 
When the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send word to them and consecrate them, getting up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Job did so continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming to from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a fence around him and his house? and all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But reach out with your hand now and touch all that he has. He will certainly curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not reach out and put your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Now on the day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the female donkeys feeding beside them and the Sabians attacked and took them. And they also killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, the Chaldeans formed three units and made a raid on the camels and took them and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job got up, tore his robe and shaved his head then he fell to the ground and worshiped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Despite all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And he still holds firm his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. However, reach out with your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. He will curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your power, only spare his life. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with severe boils from the sole of his foot to the top of his head. 
And Job took a piece of pottery to scrape himself while he was sitting in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold firm your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you are speaking as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we actually accept good from God, but not accept adversity? Despite all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, they came each one from his own place. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuite, and Zophar, the Namathite. And they made an appointment together to come to sympathize with him and comfort him. When they looked from a distance and did not recognize him, they raised their voices and wept. And each of them tore his robe and they threw dust over their heads toward the sky. Then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights with no one speaking a word to him, for they saw that his pain was very great. So now that we've read the first two chapters of Job, let's talk about them. Job is portrayed as a certain Christ. And what I mean by that is that just as our Lord Jesus was tried, suffered, and died without cause, and was faithful to the creator to the end, Job is called upon to be faithful to our God when stripped of wealth and health. The book of Job is mainly written in the form of poetry. Only the first two chapters and the two thirds of the last chapter are prose. We don't know the author's name other than it was God inspired. The structure of the book of Job and my approach in three parts. Part one is what we're going through now. Part two is chapters three through 28 containing Job's complaint the three miserable comforters and Job's responses to them, and a poem about wisdom. And then part three will contain chapters 29 through the end and 42, about Job restating his complaint to God, he, a fourth comforter rebuking Job, Job replying to God, excuse me, God replies to Job, and then Job replies to God, and then, there, then there's the conclusion, restoration of Job. I hope to show you that the book of Job reveals that God's wisdom, reveals that God's wisdom in promising humanity, exaltation, that is the kingdom of God, was demonstrated to the population of heaven through the trial Job endured. That our God is awesome, and while deeply concerned about humanity, he loves and is concerned about the rest of his creation as well. Our relationship with God can be based on hope, as well as awe, reverence, loyal love, and gratitude. Our relationship is a two-way one, and we should expect God to respond to us. So let's go over the text again, and this time with some comments and hopefully some insights that will uh, perhaps help us understand the book of Job better. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Seven sons and, seven, and three daughters were born to him. His possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 
500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the East. So Job is not an Israelite, nor does he live in Israel. Yet he worships Yahweh, the God of Israel. Job is the greatest of all men of the East. The East can be taken as somewhere east of the Jordan River, and Uz is thought to be in northwest Saudi Arabia, although nobody really knows. Job is the greatest of all men. In a sense, he represents mankind in this book. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send word and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So the brothers would invite their sisters to the feasts, showing that there was real peace and goodwill between the siblings. When the days of fasting had completed their cycle, Job would send word to them and consecrate them, getting up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Job did so continually. No reason is given as to why Job was continually worried about his adult children sinning and cursing God in their hearts. He did not say that they had actually sinned or that they had cursed God, only that maybe they did. So he made sacrifices for each one and consecrated them continually. In a sense, he acted as a priest. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The scene shifts from earth with a father praying for his children to the father of all spirits, summoning his sons to his court. The word present means to stand before, as in court before a judge. The Lord has taken his throne in his court, and the sons of God have been summoned to stand before him. It's a formal meeting, not just hanging out with a creator. Well, who are the sons of God? I would like to put this scene of God and Satan speaking to each other in its context. So I deal with a question, who are the listeners to this conversation? I acknowledge the contribution of Dr. Michael S. Heiser, who is an author and Bible professor and can easily be found on YouTube and at drmsh.com. The sons of God form a divine council, also called an assembly. They pre-existed the earth. All the sons of God shouted for joy when Yahweh laid the foundation of the earth. Job 38, 7. Just as God had created Adam and Eve to rule or manage the earth, God had his counsel to manage the heavens. They participate in God's decision making. For example, in 2 Corinthians 18, 18 to 21. They are the lesser gods, while Yahweh is the most high God. In 1 Kings 22.19, the sons of God are described as being on the left and the right of God. So they have a special place before the creator. Despite their elevated status in heaven, there are repeated instances of disobedience to their maker and Lord. The sons of God are first referred to in Genesis 6, 1 and 2. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. This cohabitation by some of the sons of God was considered an aband abandonment of their home, which was in heaven, in Jude 1 verse 6. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper dwelling place, these he has kept in, the, in eternal restraints 
under darkness for the judgment of the great day. To be clear, the scriptures doesn't say all the sons of God were imprisoned. Those who took wives of the daughters of men disobeyed and are chained up waiting judgment. At that same time, mankind became so violent that God grieved in his heart and regretted making man. He flooded the earth, wiping out what was left of mankind, sparing only Noah and his family. The sons of God are mentioned after the flood in Genesis. Uh, and let's read in Genesis 9. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The word fill is to swarm, spread out. God wanted mankind not to bunch up in one locale, but to cover the inhabitable earth. Instead of obeying God's commandment, as we can read in Genesis 11, the people said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth, which is what God wanted them to do. The 70 nations that are listed in Genesis 10 did not want to disperse as God wanted them to. So in response to man's disobedience, God gave the 70 nations different languages and scattered them across the globe. God disinherited mankind, giving them over to the sons of God to rule. This is, in re this is revealed in Deuteronomy 32.8 and 4.19-20. Deuteronomy 32.8. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God, as stated in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the Septuagint. Deuteronomy 419. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. An example of two sons of God ruling over nations is shown in Daniel chapter 10. One prince is mentioned for Persia and another for Greece. For 21 days, the prince of Persia stood in the way of an angel sent to Daniel in response to his prayers. Many other ancient societies recognized the divine council sitting in the heavens, ruling over humanity. The religions of Canaan, Garit, Samaria, Babylon, Egypt, Greece, Rome, the Chinese, and the Norse all had some kind of divine council. So there was a time when God had no portion of, that is, no rulership over the crown of his own creation, mankind. Only after hundreds of years, after working with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and finally Moses, did God have a nation, Israel, to worship him. The rest of man was still worshiping the hosts, hosts of heaven, the sons of God, who were called gods and goddesses like Zeus, Mercury, Venus, Thor, Paul, Horus, and et, et al. God warned the Israelites not to worship the gods and goddesses of the other nations. He wanted Israel to only worship him. The sons of God are judged in Psalm 82 for their failure to rule the nations as God wanted them to. With, with justice and mercy. The people walked in darkness under the rulership of the sons of God. In Psalm 82, one to seven, it reads, God takes his position in his assembly. He judges in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Salah. Vindicate the weak and fatherless. 
do justice to the afflicted and destitute, rescue the weak and needy, save them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like one of the princes. You may ask, what do the sons of God have to do with us, the church? Paul wrote in Ephesians, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, or against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In, in another chapter, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. The apostle Peter wrote, Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So it is fair to say that the sons of God are spirit beings that ruled the Gentile nations of the Old Testament. They still exist today, affecting the way the world functions and are wrestling with, a, with the church for the souls of people. However, now it is the members of the church, the body of Christ, who are, re, who are referred to as, quote, sons of God, quote, the new creations in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, let's go back to Job, chapter 1, verse 7. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Job's description of uh, God's description of Job is the same as in first in the first verse, except that Job is regarded as, quote, my servant by the creator, a high honor. God provokes Satan by pointing out one righteous man who Satan, known as the accuser, apparently hadn't been able to corrupt. In verse 9, then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a fence around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But reach out with your hand now and touch all that he has. He will certainly curse you to your face. Well, first, you may notice that Job doesn't accuse Job of committing any sin. What Job said about what God said about Job, a blameless upright man is true, and Satan knows it. Second, Satan doesn't acknowledge Job's strength of character, but implies that Job is blameless and upright only because God has made a fence around him and blesses him. He then questions Job's motivation for being upright, even though Job doesn't contradict, excuse me, even though Satan doesn't contradict Job having fear of the Lord. This is a cynical view of mankind Satan has. For Satan, the devil, humanity cannot be pious. He is simply a mercenary. Man doesn't love God, nor is really faithful to him. His love is for the blessings of God. His heart is really no good. Satan knows it. He walks to and fro on the earth. He has seen it all. Satan's portrayal of man is in direct contradiction to God's intention to one day put righteous humanity at his own right hand of majesty. Recall Psalm 8, verses 4 to 6. 
What is man that you think of him? And a son of man that you are concerned about him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you crown him of glory and majesty. You have him rule over the works of your hands. You have put everything under his feet. Even more, Satan is defiantly telling God Almighty he is wrong about man. Satan is questioning God's judgment while the sons of God are standing there listening. So who is the real audience here? I take the position that the entire record of Job is a witness to the heavenly authorities and powers, the same ones with whom we, the church, now wrestle with and to whom we are to demonstrate the manifold wisdom of God. Verse 12, then the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has in your power, only do not reach out and put your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Satan challenged God about humanity's capacity to love God, looking at the best of men alive at that time. God doesn't back down. To back down from the challenge would be to tacitly accept Satan's argument that man cannot be devoted to God from the heart. Nor does he spare Job, his, his best man, to make his point that while he made man a little lower than the angels, someday he will crown him with, with glory and honor. Oh, happy day that Jesus is our pioneer to glory and honor. We are often told to trust God, but here God trusts in Job. God has faith in Job to stand faithful, even without God's protection. The scene shifts from heaven to earth. Four calamities strike in such rapid and unexpected order that it had to be a sign from above. Now on the day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the female donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabians attacked and took them they also killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, the Chaldeans formed three units and made a raid on the camels and took them and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Each of these four devilish attacks have all but one servant killed, so that the news could be delivered. Four times while one servant is speaking, another arrives with more bad news. Report after report pounds away at Job's reality. He lost all of his children. How will he hold up? Will he curse God? Is, God, is Satan right about humanity? Then Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Despite all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. The word blame in Hebrew is tifla. Tifla means folly or unseemliness. God did not say, excuse me, Job did not say God was unseemly or foolish in what he had done. Please note it was not God who brought the disasters. He only dropped the protective fence around Job. 
So far, so good. Job has not cursed or blamed God for the disasters. He considers himself under God's rule. He understands that he is subject to the will of the Lord. What he had were blessings, and for some reason, God had to stop protecting him. Job doesn't know the reason, but trusts God did what was necessary. Please notice that Job also doesn't blame himself either. Job chapter 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man fearing God and turning away from evil. And he still holds firm his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. God again provoked Satan in front of the other angels by mentioning Job and how steadfast he has been. Verse four, Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. However, reach out with your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. He will curse you to your, to your face. Can't you just feel the hate coming out of those words? For the second time in front of the sons of God, Satan challenges God's assessment of the best of men then alive. Satan suggests that maybe God doesn't know human beings after all. Oh, but Satan implies that he does because he roams to and fro on the earth. Again, God doesn't back down from Satan's challenge. God is confident in a mere mortal's faithfulness. He still calls Job my servant, even while Job suffers loss after loss. Is it fair to say that apparently God is more concerned about what others in heaven think than how much Job is going to suffer at Satan's hand? So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he, he is in your power, only spare his life. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with severe boils from the sole of his foot to the top of his head. And Job took a piece of pottery to scrape himself while he was sitting in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold firm your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you are speaking as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we actually accept good from God, but not adversity? Despite all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, when Job's three friends heard all about all this adversity that had come upon him, they came each one from his own place. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite. And they made an appointment together to come to sympathize with him and comfort him. When they looked from a distance and did not recognize him, they raised their voices and wept. And each of them tore his robe and they threw dust over their heads toward the sky. Then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, with no one speaking a word to him, for they saw that his pain was very great. After only two chapters of this book, I think it premature to discuss applications, but we can reach a few conclusions. One is that bad things happen to good people. So don't blame those who are suffering. And if I may add, don't blame yourself. There is a spiritual realm that we have little understanding of. God's purposes may not always be about human beings. I don't think we can conclude that bad things are caused by God exposing you and I to the whims of the devil. 
that would be reading too much into the message. Nor does the message mean that all bad things are caused by the devil. The world's systems are not always a blessing. And oh, we have some responsibility too. The next part will be about Job's complaint, God's friend's advice and his responses to that advice. And I'll also add on the poem of wisdom. That will be the topic of my next teaching. Well, thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that this uh, video inspires you to read the book of Job and to come back next time. Thank you. Please subscribe and click the like button. And if you have any comments, I'd be happy to read them. Thank you and God bless.